I myself, and I think most people I meet, are interested in a type of exercise that will get the body up onto a better, more efficient, and more effective rate of running. And there is a type of exercise that will do that. And most Olympian trainers, champions, are implementing this now. It's called interval training. Have you heard of interval training? Interval training, the, the very name of it indicates what it is. It's intervals of high intensity and intervals of recovery done for a certain cycle. And it was probably first documented in about the 30s where a German physiologist was training his athletes in interval training. Bursts of high intensity, bursts of recovery. And he found when it came time for the event, his athletes had an edge. Every athlete that enters the race has the ability to win the race. But the one that wins is the one who just has that edge. And they found that this type of training gave them that edge. Then the war came, many, many things were lost. And the next time it was documented was probably the late 80s, early 90s, whereas Japanese trainer named Tabata, he was training his figure skating girls in interval training. And this is what he did. He got them to do a high intensity of 20 seconds. And then he got them to do a recovery time of 60 seconds. And this was done for a cycle of six. Doesn't take very long, does it? And he found the same thing, that his girls had an edge. His girls were breaking records. His girls were bringing home goals. They just had that edge, which defines gold from silver, from bronze for those who don't get a medal. And it was about two years ago I read a book called Body by Science by Dr. Doug McGuff. He's a cardiovascular doctor in America. And he heard of the interval training and he began to implement in his own life a 30 seconds high intensity, a 90 seconds recovery. And he also did this for a cycle of six. And he says in his book that he couldn't believe what it did for him. His brain was clearer. He was sparkier through the day. He was sleeping better at night. His digestion improved. His colon improved. He said it got to the point where he couldn't hold him down. He seemed to have so much energy. And he began to implement this with his cardiovascular patients. And he found the same thing. The results were amazing. But something else happened. He found that his patients on antidepressants were coming off their antidepressants. He found that his patients on high blood pressure, and of course this is what he did it for heart, it was coming back to normal. Cholesterol was coming back to normal. But something else happened. His diabetic patients were coming off their insulin. He scratched his head with this. He thought, wow, this is amazing. And what I am ever grateful to Doug McGuff for is how he takes you inside the cell. And he shows from inside of the cell why all of these results are happening in the body. Because as I've pointed out this week that we are just a bunch of cells and the happenings inside this cell basically is happening in the liver cell, the eye cell, the brain cell, everywhere. So understanding what's happening inside the cell gives us an idea of why these results are happening with this interval training. Before I go there, let me define high intensity. High intensity is running for your life. Can't run. Cycling for your life, can't cycle. Swim, swimming for your life. It's going as hard and as fast as you can go. That's your high intensity. What's recovery? Well, if the person's not very fit, their recovery might be leaning against a post and going, whew. If the person's very fit, it might be just a, a little jog backwards and forwards. For a cyclist, High intensity cycling up the hill. Recovery is just gliding down the hill. So that's your recovery time done for a cycle. What Doug McGuff shows that when we're getting into easily the second set of high intensity, 
This is already speeding up. 20 steps speeding up, 8 steps speeding up. Remember, I'll define that for you again. The glucose goes in under the action of insulin. It goes through a 20-step pathway. That 20-step pathway, called the glycolytic pathway, gives us two units of energy. Only two units of energy because it's an anaerobic pathway. That means it does not use oxygen. The end result of those 20 chemical reactions is a chemical form of, glu of glucose called pyruvate. Pyruvate gets fed into the eight-step pathway. The eight-step pathway is called the powerhouse. This is the Krebs cycle inside the mito mitochondria. That eight-step pathway is called the powerhouse because it delivers a whopping 36 units of energy. Wow. And we looked at the other day, it is oxygen that makes the difference. So this is your aerobic, this is your aerobic pathway. What I didn't tell you the other day is that this is a very fast pathway. This 20 step pathway is fast, but this eight step pathway is slow. And on the, on, on, and on the normal running of things, this is how it works and it works very well. But when someone starts to do high intensity, both pathways speed up and we're not surprised. Your muscles requirement for more glucose, more oxygen increases. It speeds up and it speeds up to such a rate that more pyruvate is being made than can be fed into the powerhouse. You see, this one will always be slower than this one. And when it all speeds up, more pyruvate is, is being made than can be fed into the powerhouse. So what the body does is it stores the excess pyruvate as lactic acid. So the lactic acid stores up, specifically here, we're talking about the muscle cell. So the lactic acid stores on the side in the cell. And then the person goes through recovery time. Ah, <sighs> slowing down. In recovery time, the liver converts that lactic acid back to pyruvate and feeds it in the powerhouse. This is an amazing piece of information because do you know what it means? When you're in recovery time, your body, your body is burning just as much fuel at just as fast a rate as if you were going for it. That's the good news. So the recovery time is not an excuse because you're not fit. <laughs> it's actually essential. Because if you don't have that recovery time, what's happening to your lactic acid? It's building up in the cell. So what's happening to your 5K jogger? That lactic acid is building up in the cells and actually getting quite painful. And it's quite possible if when I started to do this 5K walk, I had little intervals of recovery time, <laughs> I might not quite have had as much pain in my leg, though the pain I was experiencing was the broken muscles <laughs> building up to stronger muscles because I'd started to work muscles to the point that I had not worked them before. This is a powerful piece of information and I'm ever grateful to Doug McGuff for showing this. So the recovery time is vital because it's in the recovery time that that excess lactic acid is converted back to pyruvate and fed down into the powerhouse. Now remember, it's not the odd day you do it and the odd day you don't. And why I mention this now is, this is the best training for someone who's going to do the 10K jog, who's going to run in the city to surf. In fact, trainers are finding now that when their athletes do the interval training, they have got more stamina, more endurance, more energy when they do those long runs, if they train like this. So this is the way you train for your long distance. Coming up to the long distance, you might do a long distance once a week, just in preparation, so your body knows what's coming. But it's the interval training that gets the body up into a better state of running because of the intervals of high intensity and recovery. 
I read another book called Pace by Dr. Al Sears. And in his book, he recognizes the value of the interval training, but he takes it one step further. He says, play around with it. He says, do seven seconds one time, 30 seconds another, 10 seconds another, 15 seconds another. And really your recovery time is dependent on basically how long it takes till you got your breath back and your, your heartbeat has settled down. Al Sears tells of a lady who was very unfit in her late 50s who did seven seconds high intensity and she needed a 15 minute recovery time. Whoa, not many people are quite that unfit. The good news is, as she continues this every day, it will not remain at a 15 minute recovery time. Your fitness is not dependent on how hard and fast you can go, but how long you take to recover. And as you monitor your progress, you will start to see that your recovery time will come less and less and less. And that is your indicator on your fitness level improving. So with Dr. Al Sears and his book, progressive acceleration of cardiopulmonary exertion, there's the pace, progressive. It's progressive, it's like the lady who took 15 minutes to recover the first time she did it. It's progressive, it will not be 15 minutes within a couple of days even. It's progressive, your fitness is it progressive. Acceleration, you are accelerating. You're going as hard and as fast and as far as you can. That comes back to what I've been sharing with you. You're the doctor. <laughs> How long does it take? Progressive acceleration. You are accelerating. Cardiopulmonary. Cardio. Indicating how the heart is increasing. The more you use that heart, the stronger it gets. So let's have a look. We're looking at Dr. Al Sears' book, Pace, Progressive Acceleration of Cardio Pulmonary. Pulmonary is referring to the lungs. And he quotes a study in there called the Framingham Study. It's a little town in America. And they have done a study on the inhabitants in this little town. And not everyone, I think they did it on about 30,000 people and they did it over 25 years. It's a very well documented study often quoted in many research papers. They found that by the age of 50, people had lost 40% lung capacity. Now that's alarming, isn't it? They found by the age of 80, they'd lost 60% lung capacity. Now this week we've been looking at oxygen, the most vital element needed for life. The most powerful way to oxygenate the body is move it, is exercise. The, the heart starts pumping harder, the lungs go a little bit deeper, taking in more oxygen. When you don't exercise, those lungs don't get that deep breath in that you will always get with exercise. It's an alarming result, isn't it? 40% lung capacity lost by the age of 50, but it is not necessarily so. If you implement this high intensity exercise, your heart, your lungs will start moving. <laughs> and not only are your muscles exercised, your heart is a muscle, it's absolutely exercised, but your lungs. And when you start breathing in deep, deeply, you take in more oxygen. And what that does is that gives your body the opportunity to have enough oxygen so that every cell in your body is running down here. How are you gonna feel? You're gonna be jumping out of your skin with energy. You're gonna feel very, very good. This explains why the colon starts working better. The stomach starts working better the pancreas, the liver, the brain, the skin. Every part of the body starts working more effectively because of this. Because what I showed you here is happening in every single cell. It's getting more oxygen. The energy cycles are working more efficiently. Our eyes see because of energy. Our brain thinks because of that energy. Our 
our ears hear because of that energy. Our liver, our pancreas, our spleen, our stomach, our colon, they're all running according to the environment they're given. You see why exercise is just so important. Doing this early in the morning gets the body up onto a better rate of running. So if you have lost 40% lung capacity, how would you know? Get breathless easy. <laughs> you get breathless when you walk up the hill. When you do high intensity, everyone gets breathless, that's all right. <laughs> You might be walking with your friend and notice they're not breathless and you are. <laughs> Maybe they haven't lost 40% lung capacity like you have. If you have, there's good news. It can be revived. If a person has lost 40% lung capacity in a, short, in a short matter of time, they can actually go back to 100% lung capacity simply by in implementing this high intensity. That's why the high intensity is so important because it, it is only that will get those lungs moving. So progressive acceleration of cardiopulmonary exertion. You are exerting yourself. So you can see why Dr. Al Sears book is called Pace. Let's go back to Doug McGuff because he shows something very exciting in this cell as I have shown you. But I want to take it one step further. And because of everything you've heard this week, this will make a lot of sense. There are so many people today that go to bed late, they eat late, and they get up in the morning, they don't feel very good because they ate so late. And they've only got the energy to take a few steps to the kitchen table. Glycogen stores are still all there. Fat stores are still faithfully there. And the food that they put in goes through this energy cycle. But because the glycogen stores are full, most of it just gets shunted over to the fat cells. We are creatures of habit. Our cells are creatures of habit. And our cells have memory. And this is just what they do every day. Shunt, shunt. Dr. Doug McGuff found that his very obese patients had no energy. They're carrying around in their body the most amazing fuel depot, and yet they can't access it. They need shock therapy to, 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 to wake up. What's shock therapy? This is shock therapy. Try it. <laughs> it wakes you up. It wakes every cell in the body up to start running more efficiently. And so the brain releases the human growth hormone. The human growth hormone is called youth hormone. That's its nickname. And the human growth hormone, when it's released, it activates hormone sensitive lipase. Hormone sensitive lipase is the enzyme that breaks down fat. Yesterday, we looked at lingual lipase under the tongue that breaks down short and medium chain fatty acids. We looked at pancreatic lipase that breaks down long chain fatty acids. So what fat does this lipase break down? It breaks down your fat stores. Remember that amazing fuel depot in the body? It starts to cause a release of the fat stores. Remember, we're running out of fuel. The body now stops burning glucose as fuel and becomes a fat burner. Let me explain why it does this. Glucose burns at four calories per gram. Fat burns at nine calories per gram. You'll see that in just about every weight loss book you look at. And that's their reason for saying fat is bad. But what they don't understand is what a calorie is. A calorie is a unit of energy. And if you want a high energy food, what do you eat? Fat. <laughs> we looked yesterday at the importance of fat. We've looked at it a little bit all week. Can you now see why the body starts becoming a fat burner? Because it's going to give more than twice the units of energy that the glucose does. 
Way back in the 80s, Dr. Atkins showed this. He blew the calorie counting to the wind. He showed very clearly if a person is on a two and a half thousand calorie a day diet and it's all carbohydrates, they'll put on weight. But if they eat a two, two and a half thousand calorie a day diet and it's mainly fiber, protein and a, and a little bit of fat, he said they'll lose weight. It's a pity to know that people are still counting calories because it's not the calories, there's calories and there's calories. It's just a unit of energy. But it explains why the body now becomes a fat burner. The human growth hormone also increases the body's ability to utilize protein. And this is the release of human growth hormone increasing the body's ability to utilize protein. The human growth hormone also increases the circulation of the blood to the skin. Which means the skin doesn't age as quickly. It means the skin stays supple. It means that if a person is 150 kilos in weight and they implement this program and get down to 80 kilos, they haven't got any big lumps of fat hanging around because as they implement this exercise, causing a release of the human growth hormone, the circulation of the blood to the skin increases, which nourishes the skin and allows it to be nice and elastic and bring it back in. As you can see by what I've shown you, exercise is a not negotiable subject. I was having an interview with a friend of mine. He came and did our program. His name is Dave. He said, Barbara, I do not have an hour every morning to do a 5K jog. I nodded because I knew he was going to hear this lecture. I said, Dave, all you need is what, 12 minutes? I said, you don't need 5K and your fitness will improve to a higher level with this interval training compared to the 5K jog. And in his book, Pace, Dr. Al says, he quotes stories of people that die on their 5K jog every morning. I'm sure we've all read about it. And yesterday we looked at the acid alkaline balance in the body. We showed how disease thrives in an acid environment. Can you see with the 5K jog, what's happening to the lactic acid? It's just building up, 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 and there's nowhere for it to go until he has a rest. Again, as I said, it's not the odd day you might do a 5K jog, and it's not, not the odd day you don't. It's what you do every day that matters. <laughs> it's just simple. It's got nothing to do with genetics. It's, it's, a, it's like your bank account. The more money you put in, the more it builds up. The more you put into this, the more you will get out of it. You've probably heard the old saying, when you exercise, you will receive more energy than you expend. And you can see why that is so by what I have told you this week about oxygen and how that's what exercise does. And this is why when people implement this exercise, they sleep better because every cell in the body is getting oxygenated. And you remember when we looked at oxygen, we looked at how it invigorates, it electrifies, and it vitalizes the body, but it also soothes the nerves.